Hey guys. All right, let's continue. So we've been talking about climate change. I think we have a pretty good understanding about uh, the science of the atmosphere and the structural components. We're well versed in understanding the greenhouse effect in our troposphere and how humans are enhancing the greenhouse effect through a variety of human activities. This leads to climate change and of course the consequences of climate change we've gone over. So we're at the point now where we start having to think about how we're going to respond. What are the solutions to this? And, you know, at first glance, they seem overwhelming, right? Um, so we do have solutions. Uh, we have ways to mitigate uh, the effects of climate change. Um, and for that reason, we probably shouldn't be burying our heads in the sand. So there are solutions and we're going to look at them. So if you guys turn to page five in your yellow books, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the solutions. Um, the solutions themselves could be categorized into prevention or cleanup. So I want you guys to look at each bullet point and uh, go ahead and try to categorize each bullet in terms of whether it represents a cleanup or a reactive approach to climate change versus a preventative approach, you know, sort of keeping the milk in the bottle before you spill it. So uh, go ahead and classify and we'll come right Okay, let's see how it went. Uh, let's go through one bullet point at a time. Uh, I want to look at actually the first bullet and the second to the last bullet because there's a big difference here. Storing CO2 by planting trees versus reducing deforestation. Storing CO2 by planting trees would represent reactive approaches. It would be cleanup. In other words, the CO2 is already in the atmosphere and we're trying to mop it up by planting trees so they can sequester it through photosynthesis. Now, reducing deforestation, that's preventing those carbon sinks from being destroyed. It's keeping the carbon in the biomass of the tree, and it's also going to allow that forest to continue to maintain uh, a healthy carbon dioxide composition in our atmosphere. So that would be prevention. Second bullet, shifting from coal to natural gas would be considered prevention because you are preventing the CO2 from getting into the atmosphere since you are using a less polluting fossil fuel. We know coal gives off more than twice the amount of CO2 compared to natural gas because natural gas is a gas and it burns more complete with less CO2 emissions. Improving energy efficiency, that's getting a bigger bang for your buck, so to speak. You're getting more work out of every unit of energy. Consequently, you have to use less energy to get the job done. Uh, and that means potentially using less fossil fuels, which would reduce and prevent the emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Restoring wetlands would be cleanup. If you prevented wetland destruction, that would be prevention. But wetlands are, of course, really important carbon reservoirs. Subsidized renewable energy, that means we're using solar, wind, hydro, perhaps geothermal. Each of these give off very little, if, if not zero, carbon emissions. And therefore, that would be prevention. Putting a price on greenhouse gas emissions would be prevention because you would incentivize companies to use less polluting technologies uh, and therefore give off fewer carbon emissions. Finally, the last one is it's kind of a controversial one and it seems like a good idea initially and it might be, but it's called carbon capture and storage, CCS. Uh, and many view this as sort of a band-aid approach. In other words, if you have a coal-fired power plant and you're burning the coal, CO2 is going to come out of the smokestacks. Well, can we capture that carbon dioxide and then pump it into reservoirs underground, like abandoned coal seams? Or can we liquefy it and inject it below the ocean sediments? Seems like a cool idea and a good way to remove that carbon. Uh, the concern, of course, is are we going to be able to seal these reservoirs? And, you know, what happens if they leak? And what happens if there's a big blinding pulse of CO2 emissions happening all at once from these reservoirs? Furthermore, many argue that it just simply sort of promotes the use of coal and actually increasing the use of coal. And there's still other consequences with coal. You have to mine it, acid mine drainage. There's acid deposition from burning it, releasing sulfur dioxide. There's suspended particulate matters, which affects people's respiratory. Um, systems. So there's a lot of consequences and by using carbon capture and storage that's a process that requires energy. 
and therefore you'll just simply be using more and more of this coal in the future. So these are all really clever strategies, um, but many argue that, you know, we can't just go at this alone. There needs to be international consensus and a, a treaty amongst countries to all get us on the same page so we can solve the global environmental problem. There needs to be international cooperation. Now, this was really inspired by uh, an international policy that happened in 1987, 10 years before the Kyoto Protocol. In 1987, the Montreal Protocol was passed. 36 countries signed on to the Montreal Protocol. They did this in an attempt to solve a different environmental problem. Specifically, they were trying to solve the problem of ozone depletion in our stratosphere by phasing out the use of CFCs. 36 countries actually reduced the amount of CFCs released by 35%. Subsequent treaties after that strengthened it, and this is seen as a huge international environmental success story. Pretty amazing. So they thought, well, cool, it worked really well for stratospheric ozone depletion. Why can't it work for global climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions? It's a little bit more tricky. CFCs are used in a few industries um, and there are alternatives to those types of gases. When we're talking about greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, that's thoroughly ingrained in just about every industry, whether it's automobiles or energy production, that it becomes a lot more complicated. Nevertheless, we tried to go for it. So in 1997, uh, they drew up a treaty amongst 36 industrialized countries to reduce greenhouse gas levels by 5.2% below 1990 levels. Um, that number seems very random, but at the time they thought that was gonna be sort of a critical threshold where we could start seeing tipping points of runaway climate change, and that would keep us below those changes. Turns out in hindsight, it probably would have been woefully inadequate. Nevertheless, um, this was a nice symbolic gesture to starting to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. So how do we, how are the, how is this gonna actually work, right? So they were gonna use an economic mechanism. We call it cap and trade. And basically every country would be allocated X amount of credits of greenhouse gases then the countries would distribute those credits to various industries. So you can release X amount of pounds of CO2, for example. If that industry or that company were to exceed it, they would then have to go to the marketplace and purchase credits from other companies that were being less polluting. And again, this gave each company an incentive to look for more energy efficient and perhaps less polluting technologies so that they don't have to pay for the credits and perhaps they can make a profit by selling their credits or trading them, thus cap and trade, putting a ceiling on the amount of CO2 emissions and then using the marketplace to purchase and sell those credits. This international policy required ratification of countries responsible for 55% of the emissions. In other words, only developed countries. So for this reason, George W. Bush, the president of the United States, chose not to ratify it. At the time, the United States was by far the largest leader in CO2 emissions, um, even more so than China, who has recently surpassed us. Uh, George W. Bush felt that this was going to be harmful to our economy, um, and he also argued that why aren't countries like China and India forced to comply with this? China is a developing country. I know it's a, it's a huge economic giant right now, but its population size and per capita CO2 emissions pales in comparison to the average citizen of the United States. So for this reason, George W. Bush did not ratify it, and this was, uh, this was a, a tough pill to swallow by the international community, and I think a lot of countries were fairly angry with the United States for not ratifying this. We tried it again. Uh, in 2015, the Paris Accord, the United Nations uh, Convention on Climate Change, uh, actually attempted to create a new non-binding treaty without enforcement mechanism, but attempted to build consensus in the international community to reduce global temperatures 
below a two degree rise above pre-industrial times. And this is going to be done sort of a bottom up approach. In other words, every country was going to come up with their own list of strategies in an effort to mitigate climate change. Nothing binding here, no enforcement yet, um, just getting everyone on the same page um, to acknowledge that climate change is a big international problem and every country should be doing something about it, developing and developed countries. Uh, Barack Obama did sign the Paris Accord. However, uh, Donald Trump recently withdrew our participation from it. So we're sort of back to square one in terms of the United States participation in an international agreement for climate change. All right, that's it, guys. I uh, hope you're having a good day. Thank <laughs> you.